In this interview, we chat with Charlotte Mickelborg, director of the new multi-sensory augmented game Time Detectives, The Mystery of Mary Rose, available now on Apple and Android. You're an investigator working for the king. money and that piece of jewelry that he stashed in his chest like I told you to. I really enjoyed how interactive it was, where we saw the characters coming to life and um, were able to interact, able to see inside the ship when it was sinking. It's amazing, really. It's cool because it's like it's real because when you fire the cannon, like, you get the gunpowder sort of smell. When it first came off, I was like, wow, I didn't expect that. It was really cool. As a parent, it's good to, when you go into a place like a museum, um, you've got something which is interactive, um, holds their imagination and it's really fun at the same time. Well, Charlotte, we just checked out the trailer for this awesome looking game available on Android and Apple iPhone. Wow. How did this whole concept come about and how did you get linked up with the Mary Rose Museum? Uh, well, how did the, how did the uh, concept come about? So we, um, so we, you know, I'm in the business of making immersive experiences and each one I make in a way is different from the last because we've made immersive installation experiences. We've made interactive VR I've made film, conventional 2D film, and also 360 film that you experience in headsets. So a lot of different things. Um, and we, we'd made, a, the last piece we'd made pre-COVID was a very interactive um, VR piece called, called Fly. And then sort of COVID hit and, and there wasn't going to be as big budgets available to make massive experiences, but we didn't want kind of audiences to suffer. How could we make you know, experience that's going to be as immersive that maybe doesn't require quite the amount of investment that, that VR does. Um, and AR was kind of a natural solution to that because obviously you're not building entire new worlds, you're building kind of elements of that world, characters, objects. And um, so we started thinking about AR and then I was like, well, do we have to limit ourselves to just the audio visual or just because we're doing AR or could we still like incorporate, because a lot of my work incorporates other senses, whether that be haptics or scent. So we were thinking, you know, what could we do with that? So um, so we started, at, like, we came up with this idea of creating the world's first multi-sensory augmented reality game, and that that would incorporate, obviously, the audio visuals through the phone, but also scent. Um, and originally, we were already doing these little scent badges, and in the end, it turned out to be a, a backpack um, that just releases at certain interactive moments in, in the story, in the game. So, yeah, that's kind of where it was born, I guess. Joy, it was a COVID baby. COVID baby for sure. And why did Henry VIII's story speak to you in uh, particular? So when we, start, when we started developing it, um, we were asked to kind of come up with new immersive ways to kind of highlight or bring new audiences to like <clears throat> some of the real incredible cultural heritage sites that we have in the UK. Um, and so we, as part of that program, we we're looking at different, a few different sites like the House of Parliament and we looked at in more detail at Oatlands Palace in Surrey, which is one of Henry VIII's palaces. Um, and so when we got the funding for the full, first full game, we, uh, we were looking at partners, you know, we we're speaking to different people, Tower of London, Shakespeare's birthplace, because obviously, you know, there's just so many amazing sites to choose from here. Um, but we also had, because we were funded by something called Innovate UK, it's a government run um, body, or at least part funded by them. Um, we had a quite a limited time window. We had to make the game within like six months. So, so it was also about who could work. We, you know, cultural heritage institutions are not notoriously like fast moving. So it's also about who could work um, that, that quickly. And so the Mary Rose Museum and the Mary Rose is one of, oh, I was about to say it's one of her, Henry VIII's wives. No, no, no. <laughs> Complete mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm having Friday night brain freeze. Mary Rose sounds like one of Henry VIII's wives, but it was his favourite warship. Um, and yeah, she sank. I mean, she, she successfully sailed for several decades before um, sinking in 1545, just as we we're about to enter battle with the French. So not great timing. Um, and almost all of the 500 sailors and soldiers on board died um, in that sinking. But it's it's remain a mystery. They don't know why it happened. They they have evidence, different evidence for different um, theories. And there's lots of kind of, you know, clues. But um, but yeah, they don't know definitively. So it was a chance to kind of give you agency in the game and you become the investigator investigating the sinking and see what you make of the evidence. So um, so, yeah, no, I mean, I, I I love that period of history. I mean. 
I hate to say, there's an element of me that loves it for its brutality. Like you cannot get your head around the, the punishments that they would come up with. <laughs> Some guy who, you know, sabotaged the guns on board, had both his ears cut off. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's you know, we have a great series in the UK called Horrible Histories and it's it's mostly for kids, but I love it. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of, you know, showing you the most gruesome, disgusting things about the Tudors, the Vikings, the Roman, you know, and so... I think the Tudor period kind of fascinates me because it's not that long ago, but it is, you know, pretty, pretty different to today. So, yeah. You're, you're a creator at heart, a filmmaker at heart, a director at heart and all that. You have this great technology you, you could work with, but at times it could also be your worst enemy and handicap you in certain ways. So what kind of challenges did you face trying to tell this great story, but by also working within the confines of this technology and of course the deadline. It is interesting, isn't it? Because film, obviously you've got like your established pipelines and you know, you know what the tools are at your disposal and what lenses you can use and everything else. Um, and, you know, we're working with new technology. So there's always kind of unexpected problems that emerge. Um, and one of the key innovations in this game, other than the scent I mentioned, is that we wanted to feature photorealistic 3D characters. So the way so if you've ever played like Pokemon Go and you've sort of seen these simple kind of anime characters that pop up so what we wanted to do ours is also augmented reality so in that sense it's like Pokemon Go but we wanted you to feel like actual humans you know from the past had entered had entered your presence so um we could we have a process called volumetric capture I'm sure you know about it and basically that involves a very complex system of cameras to capture somebody really authentically in, in full 3D but that's never going to work within an app-based game because it's so heavy, you know, data heavy. So we had to, we work with a simpler form of, of, um, of volumetric capture to kind of capture that physical human or our actors um, so that it was more data light. So actually we had a single camera plus a depth kit. So very different to the full Volcap setup, but actually the end experience is not that different. Like from the front of your characters, you get a very realistic 3D impression. If you try to go around behind them, they start to distort a little and you don't have full 3D. Like they're, they're essentially more hollow behind, unlike you know a full full volumetric capture character that you, that you would be able to put into a, a VR game potentially. Um, but you don't lose a huge amount through that. And what you gain through feeling like they have just appeared in front of you, you know, is substantial. So... So, yeah, there was challenges like that and weird things, you know, as well. Like uh, we had a funny bug where this, the, the, the audio and the video for our Volcat characters would fall out of sync, which was um, was kind of throwing everyone off. Um, and, you know, other, other other sort of technical challenges, like you say, given the timeline, which was stressful, I think if we'd have had a bit more time, you, you've, you can always work these things out, can't you, given time and money? But, yeah. Yeah. We, were, we sort of had a limited supply of both. So we were trying to, <laughs> I think what came out was good in the end though. For sure. And and you've definitely become kind of like a synonymous with this space of your augmented reality, VR, kind of experimental technology when it comes to your work and everything. How long did it take you to kind of a, em, embrace all that? Because you see a lot of directors and, and creators that, you know, are a little apprehensive about that. Maybe they're like, yeah, yeah. I don't want to touch it. Maybe it, it, it's kind of killing the art of filmmaking. You kind of look at it a different way and say, no, no, no this can only enhance what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's also it's also sort of where I was coming from. So I kind of came out of journalism, actually, in 2010. I'm going back in time. Um, and I was in filmmaking for a few years. You know, I, I, I started in documentary and I, I, I progressed on to also doing fictional work. Um, but I hadn't been in it for sort of decades. I was I was clearly not a Scorsese, you know, trying to then make my move into XR storytelling. So in a way, it was it was quite nice because I discovered the medium really at the right time where I'd kind of honed my skills to a degree as a filmmaker. Um, but I wasn't so established that I didn't want to give up my hold within that industry, you know, which is obviously a very competitive industry. And um, I was actually meeting with the producer of Lucy Walker, who's an Oscar nominated um filmmaker herself and and I sort of asked our producer oh, what's Lucy working on and he said oh she's working on this 360 film and I was like oh explain that to me you know it was a time when I well I didn't know what that meant you know and he started uh, he sort of showed me this and while the technology clearly still had a long way to go um I was like yes you know this makes so much sense because why would we experience our visual medium like this when we can experience it like we experience the world so it just made a lot of sense to me like surely of course it's going to be more entertaining 
if we can fully immerse you in something, whether that be a thriller or whatever it might be. Um, and then if we can involve your other senses in that, in a way, it's almost too powerful. Like, I don't think I want to experience a horror film like that, if I'm honest. But, you know, there are certainly a lot of things that I would like to experience like that. So I kind of came at it from that point of view and was able to carve myself out, you know, a niche in this industry while it was still evolving. And that's been really exciting. When it comes to Time Detectives, were you a gamer prior to working on this or did you kind of slowly immerse yourself in the space uh, as you were working on this project? I would say more the latter. Like definitely I have played games, but I don't, I wouldn't consider myself a gamer because when I think about all the incredibly dedicated (laughs) gamers out there who've played everything, you know, if I have a conversation with one, they will lose me within a few minutes. Like, you know, we might have played a couple of the same games and then they're off and I'm like, oh no, I haven't, you know, I haven't done it. Um, So no, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't have described myself as a gamer, but um, I, I, I am, what I am is very excited about any new, method um through which you know for me the medium is not as important as how much we can uh, engage audiences in story and for me it's like life is one big very life and work is one big very fun experiment in you know can this next project make people feel even more deeply kind of involved in this story I want to tell them and so that's for me the excitement I think of of this whole area um, including the gaming area, but still with that augmented reality. You know, I think just pure gaming without augmented reality, without virtual reality is perhaps of less interest because I don't feel it's pushing the envelope as much. But yeah, that's where I am. Long term, would you like this story to either have some sort of uh, port or kind of companion piece on like, say, like PlayStation VR or some of these other bigger platforms when it comes to uh, virtual reality and augmented reality? Phone's great. It's super convenient. There's a lot of powerful phones that can run this, but... Yeah, I would assume the next step would be to kind of get into more platforms and to you'll be able to educate people or pass along whatever message. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't honestly, I haven't thought about that huge amounts um, yet because we've really just kind of completed this first this first game in in the time. What I think will be a time detective series. Um, And obviously this is this is the first of those, the mystery of the Mary Rose. Um, I mean, if you're starting to get, you know, the juices flowing in my brain now, because, yeah, I mean, it's really taking you and fully immersing you in that world through VR and such like, you know, or PlayStation VR could be could be a great deal of fun. And I could see, you know, I could see a lot that you could do with that. But I think we've been more thinking along the lines of how could we use this, you know, incredibly immersive game style to to, to sort of open up to new audiences like these incredible like places that that we have right that that actually younger audiences often don't engage with as much as older audiences and and then the fear with that is if they don't that that will they get looked after into the future so i'm kind of uh, quite passionate about sort of engaging like really showing like young young people how exciting how exciting these places are and using kind of technology to do that how exciting not just these places but these stories are because you look at some old ruins I mean that's not interesting but when you you know I don't know you know you see a murder that's committed in that way okay maybe that's a bit too gruesome but you know you see some of the stories that have unfolded like within those walls that's that's a you know that that becomes different so um yeah now you, of course, have had success in traditional filmmaking. You've had success in advertising. You're more than likely going to have a lot of success with Time Detectives as well. What's the best piece of advice you give for success? Honestly, it's a lot, there's a lot of hard work involved. <laughs> I mean, I know that someone wants me to say, I'll tell you what, there's a magic formula. Um, I wish there was. Um, you know, it's a lot of hard work and a bit of luck, I think, always along the way, for sure. Um, and and probably putting yourself out there to a degree like I, I, you know, I know other successful people who certainly sort of network their way to success. I can't say I'm particularly one of them. I have got better at doing that. But, um, but you know, it's just really about being in, in somebody's mind who might be making a decision on commissioning something or whatever. And obviously, if you're not kind of out there and um and kind of speaking to people then you're not you're not necessarily there in their mind so I think yeah hard work a bit of a bit of unavoidable networking um and and probably a bit of luck but I think that's it you kind of make your own luck because you do kind of try and put yourself in the right place at the right time or have you know have the right conversation and I also think just I think helping people I mean I, I know that sounds really kind of uh cliche or whatever but I actually think that, um, you know, 
you can there's people take different attitudes to things right some people take this attitude that, that this is my idea and you know must not steal my idea and I can't talk to anyone about it and you know because someone will steal it and you know and uh, or there's just this you know people who are just very competitive and so you sort of ask them for a hand with something or whatever and and they're like uh no you know you know there's, you made them feel very awkward even asking um, whereas I actually think, you know, having a sort of more open view, ultimately, you know, ideas of ideas. And if you're an ideas person, they come and go. You're going to have more of them. You don't need to be too worried about one getting stolen. You know, if that does happen, if you're unlucky and that does happen. But um, I think, yeah, if you can kind of do a bit of giving, you, you you know, you get back as well. So I think it's kind of a mixture of all of those factors, probably. Why should people play time detectives? Oh, why? Well, you should play time detectives if you fancy the idea of being transported 500 years back in time to experience like the sight sounds and smells of a Tudor warship and kind of be able to eavesdrop on the conversation and part of anything else if you're a girl or a woman I mean there were no women allowed on board so like get on there because that's your only chance <laughs> but no I mean I, I you know I think I think it's fun it's different to a lot of games and that it's not a game that you'll go back to and play over and over and over because it is a story-based game so you kind of you know, you play it once. Actually, you could probably play it a second time and it'd still be interesting because you can kind of follow the perspective of two main characters. Um, and, and yeah, but but um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's, it's something you will not have seen before. That much I can almost guarantee because like photorealistic augmented reality characters in games is is, you know, it, it's it's now it's not it's not before. So, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Awesome. Well, we've definitely enjoyed it so far. Hope that everybody else does as well. Looking forward to seeing more of your work, Charlotte. Thank you so much for your time. Before we let you go, where can we find you online? Oh, um, so like personally on Twitter, I'm C Mickleborg. I, the spelling of my name is a tricky one, but hopefully you'll find me. Um, and then I'm the same on Instagram and my company, slightly oddly, we're Picture This Productions, but actually we're Pick PIC This ltd limited which is how you call a uk company here in the uk at pick this limited for the company so in terms of you know new things we've got coming out that's probably a good place to follow us on insta and i think we're, we're also picture this productions on facebook i, I say i think um, there might be a couple but i think we actually did manage to get our proper title picture this productions on facebook if i remember right we've got a cool kind of circular dragon logo so hopefully you'll find us <laughs> 